Hey, Foreclosure Fix family, and welcome to another episode of the Foreclosure Fix podcast, where our goal is to help 1 million homeowners successfully navigate foreclosure. I'm your host, DJ Lojo, and I am excited about my guest today, Justin Bogart. Please welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Doing great, man. Thanks for having me on. Hey, man, I appreciate you for, for hopping on. Um, as you all know, our goal is to help a million homeowners successfully navigate foreclosure. So if this mission resonates with you, please do me a favor, like, subscribe, and share it with someone who you know can benefit. Justin Bogard is one of the co-founders of American Note Buyers. He has been a real estate investor for numerous years and is also a podcast host of Be The Bank. And he is an expert around non-performing notes, around foreclosure, and around all those things that can help our listeners. And so we're excited to dive deep into conversation with him so he can share how he would help those who are dealing with a challenging situation, overcome that situation to get to a better financial future. So Justin, please let our listeners know how you and your company interact with folks who may be facing foreclosure. Yeah. That, again, thanks for having me on your podcast today. I appreciate that. And uh, you're, you're too kind with your words there. It, Dubbing me as expert, uh, I've I've been in this business for about seven years now. I before that I kind of started off as a just a traditional real estate investor. I just I turned into a note investor and been doing it ever since. I actually mainly do performing loans is mainly what we buy and sell. But we happen to get some non performing that come across our desk and we do buy them. And so I've done all kinds of non performing loans. Um, so do you want me to go ahead and start with some stories or or what would you like to hear first? No, absolutely. So, so for our listeners, just so you can understand the nomenclature that, that Justin is using, a performing loan is a loan where the borrower is paying the lender on time every month, like clockwork, right? A non-performing loan is one of those loans where you have a hiccup and the borrower is not paying. Um, and so you have to kind of work it out to either get the borrower to repay or unfortunately file foreclosure. And so Justin, go ahead and start us off with a story about your experience with the borrower facing foreclosure? Well, uh, the, the the number one question is, that, how'd you get there, right? How, how do you get to this point? It, depending on what side you're on, if you're on the lender side or if you're on the borrower side. And, and you know, how I've been raised in this business is, you know, you want to do right by the borrower, which is why I'm glad you're trying to help a million uh, borrowers out there to prevent foreclosure. That's, that's awesome. And I commend you for that. And hopefully you're getting high up there in those numbers. What happens is, you know, we notice somebody's getting behind and the first thing we ask is, what's going on? You know, how, how can we help? What, what are your challenges? How can we help you overcome that? Because there's numerous ways that you can maneuver uh, away from foreclosure. Foreclosure is kind of like the last step and the last thing that we want to do as lenders. Uh, from my perspective, you know, it costs more money and it definitely costs time, which is, you know, going to eat at my P&L. And so I, I don't want to do that. I'd, I'd be recommended to not do that. What is best for us and what I think you know, for any note investor is really just to work with them to see if you can remodify the loan. And if they just can't afford to stay there, well, then, you know, you ask for a deed in lieu and basically you can just take the property back, avoiding foreclosure and not have to go through that process. They don't have to have that stain on their record. And then you can get the property back pretty quickly so you can do it. You can typically get into it. You know, real estate investors will flip it, wholesale it as is, maybe turn it into a rental, God forbid, or just do another uh, seller finance transaction. And that's kind of the crux of where I start. So I figure out, you know, what's their story? What's their challenge? How can I overcome it? Now, like I said, there's many different ways to overcome it, uh, you know, with government help in their local municipalities, their local county or the state level or the federal level. Uh, there's tons of money out there still for people to get assistance, as you guys well know. Uh, if you've definitely, if you've been through the COVID stuff, you know that the government can help and they will help when they can. So take advantage of that stuff because it's just, it's free money out there. Once it's gone, it's gone. And so we encourage our borrowers to go and apply for those kind of assistance funds. So what I hear you saying, Justin, for you is that one, you're trying to help the borrower, which is very, very important. But then number two, you're not emotional about it. It's, it's a business. You're trying to get to the best ROI for you and your investors, but if the borrower wants to play, you're willing to play. But if they don't want to play, you'll take a different approach. Exactly. Yeah. You, you don't want to have a cold heart approach to it. I'm, I'm not saying that, that you're saying that, but so, some people will say, well, just foreclose on them. If they're not paying for you, but like, hold on. Like, you know, you don't know what's going on on that side of the fence, so to speak. You don't, you don't walk a mile in their shoes. So I, I like to hear the story and get a comfortability of what's going on. You can't get emotional with this stuff. I'm not going to lie, DJ. 
uh, you hear some pretty sad stories and some unfortunate things that happen to people. And you're just like, gosh, you know, what, what can you do about it? Well, you can do some things about it because you're the lender, right? You make the rules. It's, it's up to you and the borrower on how this negotiation is going to happen and how you proceed forward. And sometimes ultimately you have to foreclose. And some people try to take advantage of the situation. And you got to kind of sniff that out early um, throughout what's going on. And I've, you know, I've got a few stories about that stuff and uh, definitely some great stories as well. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, you definitely got to keep your ears open and your eyes open and you just got to take the situation for what it is and figure out how you can work together. Cause yes, we do want to make money in this business. And yes, we also want to make right by the borrower. And there are a lot of times where you, it can be a win-win. Awesome. So tell us about one of the times when you did hear one of those heart wrenching or terrible stories and what you were able to do to help the borrower get to a better place. Well, there was a mother and a daughter. Uh, the mother lived in a, a place uh, in Michigan, and I forget what what city, what town it was in. And so I had bought this loan, and all of a sudden, it kind of slowly was was getting behind, and it kind of stopped paying. And I didn't know what was going on, so I reached out to the borrower, and lo and behold, to find out that the mother and daughter are on the mortgage. The mother is the one that actually lives there, and the daughter, excuse me, is kind of like the you know the co borrower on there to help. Uh, pay the mortgage if the mom is not able to. I assume the mom was probably on some sort of, uh, you know, Medicaid or some sort of disability to where they, they didn't have full-time employment, but they were able to get money coming in to pay the mortgage. Well, she had passed away. Yeah. And so it was difficult for the daughter because she didn't live in the house. She had her own apartment in her own, you know, financial situation, you know, across town, but she also didn't want, you know, her, her mom's house just to, to go awry. She was trying to figure out what to do and, and to rent it. And then she also had to go through probate because the mom didn't have a will, didn't have a trust and didn't have anything set up for when she passed. And so obviously it was a very difficult time for her and she was the only sibling as well. So I don't know if the, if there was a husband around, I assume that there wasn't, uh, judging cause I know the end of the story, but yeah, it's just, it's just a struggle. And you just think to yourself like, okay, yeah, the, what are my options as a lender? I, I can foreclose on them and I can ask for the, the stuff, but if she doesn't have the money to pay for it and she has to go through probate, I don't know if you've been through a probate process with any of your borrowers or anything, but it can take a while. And so it was at least a year that it took to go through probate, um, just for her to be able to get and be able to sign for stuff. And so I just sit there and wait, you know, I just, I help them out. I would help winterize the property, um, you know, make sure the taxes aren't going to get too delinquent to where they become a problem and just, and just play, play the game. Uh, the reason why I was able to kind of help them along and just kind of push forward a little bit so that they wouldn't lose the property, um, to, you know, to foreclosure was, was really because of the story and because they were very transparent and open and they were very communicative with me. And that's kind of the key to success. Like, like one of the things that I think you hone in on is, is what, you know, not only do you, why do you want to help the borrower, but what can the borrower do to help prevent this stuff? And it's really communication. That's what it comes down to, because if they're just honest and they're transparent, and they, you know, they answer messages when you send them and they're, and they're very, you know, willing to, you know, they're not skirting around questions. They're not giving you the hem haul. Um, that, that's really what makes me want to help them even more and kind of get outside of my comfort zone and just go beyond to make sure that they you know, have a place to stay and stuff. So long story short, um, you know, we're, uh, they were able to get the probate done and then they were able to go to a regular retail uh, sale of the property through a real estate agent. A brokerage so they can actually put money in their pocket. Cause if it wasn't just foreclosure, they pretty much would have been out of all of the equity that, that they would have had in there. Uh, cause they wouldn't have sold for very much at the foreclosure steps, but because they were able to do those things and I kind of kept, uh, kept with them for the long run. Um, I still got paid off my unpaid balance that I was owed plus any, you know, arrearage accounts or any advancements that I made. But then again, they also got to put money in their pocket too, which was nice too. So it was just, it was just nice feeling to know that I could give some sort of relief to the tragic things that had happened to this, this young lady uh, with losing her mother. And so that's, that was kind of the, the first story that kind of came to mind. You just said a lot there and a lot that I want to unpack because <laughs> I think, and, and I say that in a good way, right? Because I think that you dropped some gems for our listeners and, and I love Dirty Little Secrets on this podcast. And you said a f you said a few things that were uh, that are that's so important that people really need to understand if you're facing foreclosure. One, you talked about honesty and transparency. The fact that you need to be honest about your situation and transparent about your situation is so important. And because of this person's honesty and transparency, 
you waited over a year to do anything. You waited over a year when you could have foreclosed in a state like Michigan in, in a few months, right? And you waited over a year because they were honest and transparent. And so if you are out there and you're listening, you're facing foreclosure and you're trying to game the system and you think that you're being slick by not giving all the information or lying to people, I'm telling you, it will come back to bite you in the rear end. So please be honest because when people are sitting down and looking at your file, if they trust what you're saying, they will go the extra miles to try to help you if possible. So I appreciate that. The other thing that you said is that because you were willing to work with them, they were not only able to pay you off in full as the lender, but they were also able to make money on the transaction. And that is one of the things that I get excited about for people, because I think everyone thinks that when you go through foreclosure, the worst case scenario is that you just lose the house. Yeah. But when people are able to address the situation, there are a couple of things that can happen. One, they can avoid the foreclosure, but two, they can profit. And so, Justin, we were talking backstage about um, another situation in Michigan that did not go as well. Um, and so maybe tell our listeners a little bit about how that one played out, because the outcome was very different in this. Yeah. So uh, coincidentally, it was another uh, property in Michigan. I, I kind of found this note from a motivated note seller. It was a land contract at the time. And when I bought it, I said, my stipulation is, you know, not only will I buy it from you, but I would like you to uh, convert this thing to a note and mortgage before I buy it. And so we went through the process of going through a title company. I noticed the borrower was a little bit behind when I when I was, you know, doing my due diligence on the note. So I negotiated my price to give myself a good, a good risk level there as the lender to protect myself in case they weren't going to pay. And so I actually had conversations with the borrower, you know, did an estoppel with them, asked them the questions, asked if they were willing to sign this new documentation, you know, leaving everything the same except, you know, rolling in some of the, the costs into the uh, loan. So they were behind on taxes. Uh, they didn't have any insurance at the time. And so we, we fronted those costs and we kind of rolled them into a loan with a new price. Um, and they were very honest with us up front and, and, um, you know, they communicated pretty well with us and I, and they even brought the first month's payment to the closing table to kind of help because I didn't really ask for a down payment because this wasn't a newly originated loan, just like remodifying a current situation. Uh, so one, I was able to get rid of the land contract, which is good. I prefer not to have the land contract. So I got the net mortgage, which was better for me. And it gives them peace of mind of holding the deed in their hand, the borrower on top. So the, the borrower kind of didn't make the second payment. They didn't make the third payment. Uh, they didn't make the fourth payment. And so we're reaching out to them, asking what's going on. And they, they said they had COVID. They, you know, they said that they, you know, had, had to go to the hospital for something. Um, you know, just, just giving us some pretty, some pretty scary excuses that, that hopefully they weren't real. Uh, it turns out that they weren't, as you can tell by this story, but they kept giving excuses. So then we kind of understood, okay, they're kind of working the system. And then they were smart enough to make a payment before we had to start foreclosure before like the 120th day. So then, you know, we, we ended up accepting the payment and so that we had to start all over again. So they delayed it another couple of months and gave us some more excuses. And then they kind of started ghosting us and just kind of went dark for a while. And it got to the point to where I was able to start foreclosure and went through the foreclosure process. And as, as you brought up in Michigan, it doesn't take long to actually get to the foreclosure process. People that are a little bit slick, what they do is they know there's a redemption period. And so in that redemption period in Michigan, it takes about six months to go through that process. And so during those six months, they're allowed to squat there. There's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. They're allowed to be in there. The situation was at the foreclosure when it happened, the the guy that was the borrower actually didn't live there, what we found out. He said that this is my son that actually lives in the property. He wasn't paying me uh, the rent payment that I was charging him so that I could pay the mortgage because I have another house. I think his parents passed away and then he was living in his parents' house and paying the mortgage on that one. It sounds like the son was just kind of hosing over the situation here. So he actually went to the courthouse steps to see if the house would sell. And then he noticed it didn't sell. And that's when all of a sudden he started communicating with uh, the lender us or our servicer and saying, Hey, look, I noticed it didn't sell at the foreclosure steps. So you can't remove us from the property. I'm thinking like, okay, this guy's obviously working the system here. So anyways, all right. However many months go by with during a redemption six, you know, actually it went longer than six months because, um, unfortunately, 
you know, you have to work with attorney's timetable when it comes to evictions after that. So that, that took a couple of months too. And I lost a month of momentum as well. So this is just, uh, you know, good information for lenders to know, you know, you want, you want to stay on top of things on your timeline with foreclosures and redemptions and evictions, because as soon as you miss a step, you know, there could be weeks that go by or sometimes months and you really lose traction on what's going on. So just, just a little side note there, but we get through the eviction process finally. And then, um, you know, the judge has to order the writ for the sheriff to go out there. And then lo and behold, the sheriff gets out there and they, they find that this place is just like, uh, it's a, it's a pigsty, you know, they've got all their, their hoarding and stuff was there and they ended up having like, you know, two or three dumpsters, large dumpsters full of stuff that they got rid of in this house. And then, uh, finally it, and the story hasn't ended yet because it's all cleaned down and it's actually listed for sale right now. And we're trying to sell or finance it locally there, uh, for, you know, private financing, financing with deserving buyers. Uh, so we're getting some traction there, but yeah, this, the whole process has actually been taking about a year and a half just to get to that point. Um, I was kind of, you know, more trustworthy in the beginning when I, I trusted the borrower and took their word for it. Uh, but then again, you know, I don't, ha I didn't have a lot of skin in the game as far as the deal versus what the property uh, value is, which is good for me, but it's just unfortunate that, you know, they take the situation and they just, they're able to go further and further. So I guess the more of the story is, you know, uh, wh when they can squat, uh, sometimes they'll squat <laughs> and they'll stay till the very last second that they can. So it was almost like they went probably 12 to 13 months pretty easily without like paying, paying on a mortgage. In that scenario, what I find very interesting is that if this person would have communicated with you, if they would have been honest and transparent, they could have walked away with money in their pocket if they just would have worked with you versus now they get nothing. They're out of somewhere to live and you as the lender now get to recoup your fees in a different way. And I think that that is a big mix misconception that a lot of homeowners have is that every lender is rich or a big bank with millions and billions of dollars just sitting away. A lot of times when lenders are fronting all these fees for taxes, uh, city uh, code violations, other things, uh, forced placed insurance and things like that, that is coming out of their reserve. And some of these individuals are not big companies. They're people like you and me who may just be regular, hardworking people. And so I think that understanding why the communication is so important is another key thing. Another thing you talked about borrowers ghosting you. This is the thing that just pisses me off more than anything else. And another reason why this platform to me is so important. You know, how often do, does that happen to you? And what kind, kind of things have you done to maybe combat that? And the last part of that question is, how does it make you feel as a lender when borrowers do ghost you? Well, it, it doesn't feel very good. It, it, it is putting salt in the wound, but um, I'm a fund manager well, so I manage our fund as well. And I have to look at it, you know, I have to look at the portfolio, not just individual situation. But, you know, when you do get in, and it's, it's tough not to be the telephone tough guy, you know, pick up the phone or, or text them and be like, you know, you can't do this to me. Um, but you have to sit back and understand like there are rules in place for a reason and there are things you're allowed to do and there's things you're not allowed to do. And the worst thing you can do as a lender is get into a, a pissing match with the borrower because it's going to go nowhere and you're definitely not going to win. The last thing I, I want to do is have a conversation with somebody that's ghosting me. And you can kind of tell after a while of doing these things of who's really going to be compliant with you. And the best thing to do is just, you know, to follow the, the process, use the attorney, send out the letters that you're supposed to and just don't have communication with them unless, unless you're able to, you know, I try to reach out, reach out nicely, even though I know they're taking advantage of the situation and, uh, you know, you got to put on that ha happy face, but definitely the worst thing you can do is, is get in a pissing match with them because you don't want them to trash the house and, and tear everything up because that's just going to make things a lot worse. Absolutely. I, I agree, man, but it's just so frustrating because it is as someone who is out there trying to help somebody, it is the worst thing in the world. We recently had a situation where it was a, a, a elderly couple who was on a fixed income and they received the foreclosure paperwork, just a demand letter, and we were trying to help them. And we asked them to get their kids involved to try to figure something out and crickets for like 60 days, you know, no modification package, nothing. 
we called numerous times and it's just like one of those things where it's like, we're trying to help you and you just are ignoring us. Uh, so it's tough. But with that, Justin, this leads me to my favorite part of the podcast, which is our bow tie round, right? And our bow tie round is when our listeners get to tie one on with our guest, Justin Boba. Um, and so the B in bow tie stands for your best advice for someone facing foreclosure. The O stands for one thing you are grateful for. And the W stands for your wildest or most interesting foreclosure related story. And so with that, let's start with the B. What's your best advice for someone facing foreclosure? Communication, plain, plain and simple, just honesty and communication, being transparent, especially with lenders uh, like us, you know, that are smaller lenders, not like Bank of America. We're going to be able to listen to your story and we're going to be able to, you know, help you out as long as uh, I, I don't know. I don't know if many people. There's probably a, a few people that probably wouldn't be so nice, but most of us, you know, I would say a large percentage of us, uh, we're going to listen to you. And we're going to be able to help you out and do things or even give you advice and say, hey, have you tried this? Did you know that the government, you know, if you go to this federal website, you can go and ask for a mortgage assistance, you know, go to your local municipality and ask for help. So there's tons of things that we can do as lenders to help them out. And they just have to be honest, and communicate. And if, if it's one of my loans, definitely I'm going to help you out in any way I can because a profitable loan is a paying loan. You can't say it any better than that. All right. So one thing you are grateful for right now. I'm grateful for the community, the networking, uh, note investing community that, that we have to be able to rely on, on other people's experiences in different counties, different states to, to help me out in situations. Um, yes, I've been in the business for seven years. I've, I'm definitely not the most seasoned person out there, but I'm definitely not a new person, but I, I, I rarely see the same thing happen twice. And so this is what I love about this business is because it's always unique and there's different ways uh, to underwrite deals. There's, there's no, no two notes alike, no two borrowers alike. Uh, so having the network is what I'm grateful for because I can pick up the phone and contact somebody maybe in that state or, you know, ha having many mentors in this business, it's, it's definitely uh, is what I'm grateful for. So I have the confidence going forward that I can, you know, either get out of a situation or before I get into that situation, I know the best way to reduce my risk. Your wildest or most interesting foreclosure related story. The most wildest one uh, didn't end up being a foreclosure. It was a remodification and was interesting because we found a motivated note seller. The lender was the sister of the borrower. So the borrower and the lender are both sisters. Okay. So basically the lender lent her sister money to, you know, have the house and stuff. So this ended up being a manufactured home that the borrower was renting out. So the borrower was being a landlord and the lender and the sister had a falling out at some point. Okay. And they are not communicating to each other. They're, you know, they've, they've just completely don't communicate. You know, he said, she said stuff. So in the process of buying this loan, I'm, you know, having a, a conversation with the lender, finding out their side of the story. I'm having a conversation with the borrower, finding out their side of the story and nothing is lining up. Um, and so I'm hearing two different stories. So I finally get to the point to where I can buy the loan for a certain price, knowing what I'm getting into. I finally, I talk with the borrower and I figure out what they understand, what's going to happen and going forward. And basically the borrower is like, I'm willing to pay. I'm just not willing to pay her. <laughs> <It's> so, <laughs> so I knew that this was going to be a good situation to have a remodification. So after I acquired a loan and I communicated with the borrower and, and she's been great ever since she's been paying on time. We came up with a payment plan to get caught up, to get their, you know, arrearage count, late fees and taxes, everything caught up. And they've been a great payer ever since. And it was, it was just all because they just didn't want to deal with the, uh, the family, you know, it's that, it's that one person in the family that you just don't want to do business with. It just happened to be those two people at some point made a loan to each other and then it just went awry. But that was the kind of the wildest one. Um, uh, my partner, Richard Thornton and I, we, we laugh about it. We, we call it the two sisters loan, uh, just because we just, it was just so unique, but we were the problem solver. Like we were the solution for everybody. The lender knew that they weren't going to get any money out of the borrower, their sister, uh, because of the falling out. And the borrower knew that they didn't want to get foreclosed on. So I was the solution for both sides. So it just worked out for our favor, but it's pr pretty wild. Yeah, Justin, who would have thought that you'd become a, a family therapist as, as right. part of your note investing career, right? It's part of due diligence. You have to have <laughs> a, a, a therapeutic with your everyone. Uh, 
Justin, we 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 appreciate you so much for 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 swinging by our podcast today and for just sharing this candid advice with with our listeners. Um, do us a favor. Let us know how we can stay in contact with you. We can follow your journey and how people who may be interested in, in, in working with you in the future can, can reach out. Yeah, I appreciate that. Let, let me plug. So on YouTube, if you look up American Note Buyers, you can find our YouTube channel, which we got all of our content up there for free. We've got educational stuff up there. We got a playlist for our monthly live broadcast we do, which is more educational. We show case studies and break things down with, you know, how the mortgage market is operating. Uh, that's the second Wednesday. So we actually did one last night that was live. Uh, you can also find the recordings of our podcast on there as well that we do. It's called Be the Bank, which you, you mentioned earlier. Thank you for doing that. It comes out every other week. You can download it on any podcast directory. It's called Be the Bank. Those are the best ways to get like, uh, you know, free information of what we do. Now, if you want to reach out to us, we have a website called anbfunds.com. That stands for American Note Buyers Funds, F-U-N-D-S dot com. That's the great way to get a hold of us as well. So you can see uh, our fund that we manage and any assets that we have for sale. You know, you can reach out to us through our website and we'd be happy to help you out. Well, thank you so much, Justin, for being on the podcast today. And if this mission resonates with you to help a million homeowners successfully navigate foreclosure, click the subscribe button. Um, follow us on all social media platforms uh, and let us know. Leave us a review. Tell us what we're doing and, and how we can do it better. If you have questions, we are here to answer them. As always, my name is TJ Lojo. Thank you so much for listening. I love you and God bless you. Thanks, TJ. Thank you. The views and opinions on this podcast are for informational purposes only and should not be construed as legal advice. If you have a specific legal question, we highly recommend you contact a qualified legal professional.